it says amit singh is requesting to annotate the content who is amit singh amit singh is from your group uh, sir he is present here uh, dr amit hmm. can everybody else mute themselves so we will not have any problem Again, content has gone. Yes, sir, it is gone. Yeah, who is Amit Singh? He is joining. No, oh, already joined. Something. Something has happened. You know, when I said Amit Singh. Oh. oh. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. No. Okay. Now quick. So this lady, age fifty-eight, presented uh, with a um, blood discharge from the nipple. You can see the picture. Can you see? Yes, sir. Can you see? Yes. Drop yes, of blood, right yes. in the picture here, and uh, she had a, a big lump, eight by five centimeter, hard lump. So we uh, arranged. Uh, Mammogram. They showed calcification, micro calcification, diffusely present, and uh, then a biopsy showed ductal carcinoma in situ with lot of comedo necrosis. So this was the picture, and uh, so with this uh, um, background, we start uh, talking about the carcinoma in situ, and let us uh, go back to the uh, natural history of uh, breast lesions, starting from the normal ducts. Where we have uh, uh, up to two layers of ducts, two layer of cells, one luminal cell and one basal cell. Okay, luminal A cell, basal B cell. A se under, B se bahar. And luminal A cell are responsible for producing milk, and uh, they are responsive to estrogen. They have estrogen receptor protein, and uh, basal cells usually lack the receptors, and basal cells are uh, they have right to support the luminal cells and uh, they are responsible for type of carcinoma called basal carcinoma basal type so under the influence of some uh, mitogenic activity mitogen hormone or some stimulus or some carcinogen uh, initial picture is that of intraductal hyperplasia so can you see the picture this one can you see my arrow moving yes yes hello yes sir yes So more than two layer is called hyperplasia. Up to two layer is normal. More than two layers of cells in the duct or the lobule is called hyperplasia. Okay, but cells are still looking like normal cells. No abnormality. No atypia. No dysplasia. Here cells are looking abnormal. They are bad cells. So uh, or pathologists call it atypia or dysplastic cells. So there is a state of atypia. Okay. So hyperplasia means more than two layers of cells. And when they are looking abnormal, they call it atypia. So hyper, it is hyperplasia more than two layer plus abnormal, abnormal looking cells. This is called atypical ductal hyperplasia (ADH). If the same change occurs inside a lobule, we will call it atypical lobular hyperplasia (ADH and ALH). And remember, ADH and ALH are high risk lesions. High risk lesions. They increase the risk of a lady. to develop breast cancer by four times the relative risk of cancer occurring in two, if you are comparing the risk in two ladies one who has adh and other who does not the relative risk is four so she has four times greater risk greater chance of developing breast cancer compared to a lady who does not have a typical ductal or a typical lobular hyperplasia so adh and alh are high risk lesion relative risk for cancer conversion Four to five, okay. And if there is family history with ADH, the relative risk can go and jump to even twice, maybe ten to eleven. Now, from that stage, the next stage is that same these abnormal looking cells fill the whole duct. They fill the whole duct, okay. Still, the basement membrane is intact and outer layer is intact, okay. The so this will be called more than two layers. Lesion measures more than two mm in diameter, more than two mm in diameter, diameter, or it involves more than two ducts. 
then we will call it ductal carcinoma in situ. So the difference between ADH and uh, DCIS is only in the size of the lesion and number of ducts involved. Size of the lesion and number of ducts involved. Okay. So to summarize, atypia in atypia seen in more than two ducts or the lesion measures more than two mm. So this there is some atypia, but it's still it's only in one duct and basal membrane is intact. We will just call it ADH. If it involves more than two ducts, one duct here, one duct here, one duct here. So three ducts are involved or it measures cross sectional diameter is more than 2 mm. Then we will have to use the term DCIS. So just remember the rule of two. Rule of two is that normal cells are up to two. If they are more than two, it's called hyperplasia. If there is atypia, then it call it a typical ductal hyperplasia. Then the next rule of two is up to two ducts, ADH. More than two ducts, DCIS. Less than two mm, ADH. More than two mm, DCIS. So rule of two is more than two ducts involved or two millimeter involved, and hyperplasia means more than two layers of cells. Okay. So it is of two main broad categories: low grade and high grade. Low grade and high grade. Okay. So low grade is just this. Atypia, but involving more than two ducts, and this, okay. But in high grade, we have intraepithelial carcinoma. It's more aggressive, and more aggressive. Like you see in this diagram here, you still have abnormal looking cells, but basement membrane is intact. Okay, it's not broken. Here it is broken. Okay, then it becomes invasive cancer. So high grade intraepithelial carcinoma with intact basement membrane. That's the difference, and there can be necrosis. Uh, comedone, you remember in acne, uh, we say blackhead or comedone, you know, the debris from the discommitted epithelial cells uh, in the hair follicle, uh, which comes out as blackhead or comedone in an acne. Or uh, in sebaceous cyst, you get cheesy material coming out. So, comedo means this, that cheesy material. It is called comedo or comedone. So, that type of necrosis of cells. In the lumen will be called comedonecrosis inside the duct, and this is a feature of high grade. So high grade differentiation, or it can be like a sieve, like a net, you know. Uh, so cribriform, it's called cribriform, like a jali, jali, you know, or um, like a uh, you know you mesh, you have a mesh uh, like proline mesh, you know, that uh, net like appearance. That's called cribriform, and or it can be solid. So this is called intermediate. So you have low grade, high grade, and intermediate grade can also be present. And moreover, uh, these three types have different uh, proliferative markers. They are cellular uh, markers which cause proliferation. They are different, and probably there are different regulatory genes which govern these three types of DCI. Yes. Okay, and their calcification pattern may also be different. So uh, there was a gentleman called Silverstein. He has done a lot of work um, in uh, um, ductal carcinoma in situ in DCIS. He has written a big book on DCIS, Dr. Silverstein. So maybe in your library, you may find this book or you can go on the net to read this book uh, by Dr. Silverstein. So he established the first dedicated exclusive breast center in the world, I think in California. And it was called Vaughan News Center, Vaughan News Breast Clinic. So in that clinic, Vaughan News Breast Clinic, uh, this uh, categorization prognostic index was developed, hence it is called Vaughan News Prognostic Index. Okay. Um, so what are the parameters used in this? Size in three categories, less than 15, 15 to 40, and microscopic margin. Uh, so this, you can apply this. Uh, you can apply this classification only after removal of the tumor. Okay, it is not pre-operative. It's a, a prognostic index based on histology of the removed lump or removed specimen of ductal carcinoma in situ. Okay, so this is a histological diagnosis given by the pathologist on the report of a excisional biopsy or full mastectomy. So they check the 
microscopic margin of clearance and if margin clear can be more than 10 mm or 1 to 10 mm or less than 1 so you have three categorization then you check for grade and degree of necrosis comedo necrosis present if it is low grade then there will be no necrosis you give the score of 1 if it is low grade but necrosis is present then you give a value of 2 and if it is high grade plus minus necrosis then you give a value of 3 okay so you similarly um, so if a patient has a less than 15 mm lesion okay you give a value of 1 is that clear less than 15 mm give a value of 1 see less than 15 mm lesion on histology give a value of 1 margin of excision is more than 10 mm give a value of 1 is low grade with no necrosis give a value of 1 so you 1 1 1 so total score will be how much 3 okay later on so he said dr silverstein said if you have 3 it is the best prognosis and just lumpectomy may be enough you okay no further treatment maybe just radiotherapy now somebody later added the category of age also in this so more than 60 years gave value of 1 40 to 60 give value of 2 less than 40 years which is bad prognostic factor give value of 3 1 2 and 3 okay is that clear 1 2 and 3 so if somebody had a she is more than 60 years her tumor is less than 15 mm so this is value of 1 margin of excision more than 10 mm value of 1 no low grade no necrosis value of 1 is plus 60 so value of 1 so 1 2 3 and 4 so she gets a score of 4 so 4 to 6 total score means it is low score and excisional biopsy with just radiotherapy or just maybe sufficient or only tamoxifen 7 to 9 is called intermediate grade so suppose somebody had a 15 to 40 millimeter lesion so value of 2 margin of excision is between 1 to 10 value of 2 and she had necro with necrosis value of 2 so 2 2 and 2 6 and age suppose she is under 40 so that is 3 so 6 plus 3 9 so she will come in the intermediate grade okay and then 10 or 12 was high grade 10 uh, how will it be 10 just see so value of uh, more than 44 centimeter lesion okay margin less than one so three and three nine and her, uh, her she has high grade with necrosis three 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 nine plus uh, suppose she is 40 under 40 so three so or 12 so that is score of 12 for a lady will be called high and it was decided by dr silverstein that uh, Lead, lead MS. 4 to 6 lumpectomy alone, 7 to 9 maybe with radiotherapy and tamoxifen if it is ER positive. So, this was the classification given by Dr. Silverstein, and because he opened this clinic uh, called Von News Clinic, uh, it was called Von News Grading System. But presently, there have been some problems in validating this scoring system outside his clinic in other centers and they try to emulate this system and they found that it is not working well in the other centers in outside dr silverstein's clinic so people have now not abandoned but have not um, given that much importance to one new system but if in the exam somebody may ask and you should know what is one new system okay one new prognostic indicator based on size microscopic margin of clearance grade and necrosis and age four values are scored and then the total score is created just like uh, you know your abgar score or or um, for, uh, this uh, glasgow coma scale you know so mr prognostic indicator now we have more importance given to molecular marker It has 
mostly ER receptor positive. ER receptor positive, maybe PR is also positive, but HER receptor is negative. Okay, and KI sixty seven, which is a marker of what is KI sixty seven indicating? Please tell somebody. Proliferation. KI sixty seven. Proliferation. Mitosis. Yeah, it's a it's a proliferative marker. It indicates it. The degree of proliferation or mitosis in the tumor. If uh, uh, tumor cells are proliferating rapidly, high mitotic figures are found, then KI sixty seven score is high. And uh, when you do special stain for cytokeratin, what is cytokeratin? Cytokeratin. Keratin. Cyto is skeletal markers. The pan epithelial. It's a skeleton. It is cyto skeleton. Skeleton within the cell. So when you go outside and see some new building being constructed, uh, they first uh, the building man architect architect put steel rods, you know, steel rods and pillars, and then they cover it with concrete and bricks later on. So those the steel rods are the skeleton of the building. Similarly, inside the cell, cell the steel rod is put in the building so that building doesn't collapse. Similarly, God has put a steel rods within the cell so that the cell doesn't collapse, and that is called cytoskeleton. These cytoskeleton are composed of protein called cytokeratin. Cytokeratin, just just as you have keratin on your uh, squamous uh, epithelium, you know, um, keratin layer, stratum corneum, or keratin of the hair, keratin of the nail. So similarly, a special type of keratin. Forming the cytoskeleton, skeleton within the epithelial cells. Cytokeratin is present only in the epithelial cells. It's not present in the mesodermal cells or mesenchymal cells. So, cytokeratin is a marker of the epithelium, and different epithelium have different cytokeratin as marker. Epithelium in the mouth will have different cytokeratin. In the breast, will have different. In GI tract, different. In um, genitourinary tract, different. So cytokeratin type eight, eighteen, fourteen, and seventeen. These four are said to be positive in this low grade type. High grade term is used when ER, PR are negative. HER is positive. Please remember that in breast tissue, presence of or up regulation of human epidermal growth factor type two protein or HER two protein. Is thought to be a feature of aggressive nature of the tumor. Aggressive nature of the tumor. Okay, so tumors which are aggressive, invasive breast cancer as well as DCIS, express or have a regulation of HER2. HER is hum acronym for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor Type 2. There are four types of HER. Human epidermal growth factor type one, two, three, and four. So epidermal growth factor EGF, okay, and type two EGF is called HER. Okay, there are four types of EGF. So if you have this type ER, PR negative, HER positive, with high mitotic index, and they are positive for cytokeratin five and six. So this cytokeratin is different in different types of tumors. Okay. And third is basal type. So these two are from the luminal cells. Okay, from the luminal cell. This is a basal type from the basal cell layer. Luminal B and HER2 rich. They are high grade. So basal and luminal B and HER2 rich are high grade. All DCIS are strongly positive for E catherine. Remember this fact because um, there is a. It's E catherine is like a intercellular bridge. Like you know, desmosomes. Remember desmosomes in between cells, cell to cell uh, bridging. So intercellular bridge. So bridge protein. So this is E catherin. So E catherin is lost in lobular carcinoma in cell. E catherin is lost in LCIS. Okay. So DCIS has a strongly positive E catherin. Now you can have. Calcification of two different types, either segmental or in low grade, or branching and pleomorphic in high grade. So let us see some mammograms.
where we have so can you see this yes sir okay i'm just trying to magnify it can you now see yes yes so when i ha huh, okay so under the magnification you can see you can see this area can you see this area there's a clip here yes, yes. can you notice a clip yes there's a stainless steel clip stainless steel clip and and see this micro calcification micro calcification Yeah. So yeah. this calcification, so this calcification is a. Hey, there's some. Hey, there's some. Echoing, echoing. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Are you noticing this echoing of the sound or? It's it's, it's gone. Only me. No, it's gone now. It's gone. It's thank gone. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, when this lady came to us, we noticed this micro calcium. And please note, this is the nipple. and right from the nipple right from just under the nipple you can st see start seeing this micro calcification they are of different shape and different sizes different shapes and different sizes okay so this is called pleomorphic pleomorphic means different morphology they are not si similar they are not unimorphic or monomorphic they are pleomorphic some large some abnormal some round some long some uh, quadrangular all shapes and sizes and it's a cluster so please remember the term cluster cluster of pleomorphic microcalcification that's a hallmark of cancer cluster of pleomorphic microcalcification you know in america and sweden and europe england why mammography uh, mammographic screening is so popular because they take the lady 50 and above and do this mammogram and they say oh we have seen early cancer and then they operate her and they feel quite victorious you know that uh, um, they have detected the cancer in a very early stage what is called in situ stage which is curable cancer and that's uh, the victory of mammographic screening so this is the feature that uh, they see they look for and when our radiograph radiologist uh, find this lesion they take a biopsy but at the time of biopsy they put a steel clip can somebody tell why why they put a clip here at the time of biopsy so that it is easier to uh, find it while operating very good so if the report comes as as been as a, a cancer so they know which area was biopsied and they will have to then because nothing is palpable nothing is palpable please also appreciate that if you have calcification like this perhaps it is not mandatory to put the clip because whatever the report even if report is benign i will still insist my radiologist to please put a wire and let me remove this area this will be called highly suspicious virat 4 or virat 5 so virat 4 or 5 lesion and the rule is that must be removed okay uh, last year we had dr jatoi you know doing the aims best course and he uh, in a lecture he said the rule is that virat 4 lesion must be removed must be removed regardless of what the histology is even if it says benign we will still remove it and because you can see the micro calcification repeatedly so some uh, people will argue that if you have a distinct micro calcification like this perhaps you need not put a clip but here clip was put so that we know which area was biopsied so if we did not have this type of micro calcification just a small looking lesion and that area on biopsy shows benign lesion some people will say that okay you got a clip and call her for follow up maybe six monthly or yearly mammogram and look for any increase or change in the picture if there is no change you can identify that area by this clip so there are now 
company is making three or four or five different shapes and sizes of the clips some are round some are uh, uh, like you know longitudinal like this other have a star like appearance so that if the lady has some suspicious lesion one year you take biopsy i put this a star here it's benign so there is no need to excise to so put a star other uh, next year he has some abnormal lesion here you take a biopsy and put some rounded structure here again report is benign so he still put it similarly you can have uh, four three or four clips put in the same breast for subsequent follow up if any area becomes abnormal later on you know that this is the area which on previous biopsy had shown this picture and now it is growing it is becoming abnormal so you do the surgery at that time okay so the clip has insert was inserted and now we'll just put a wire and excise the whole area and if it is diffusely present we will give her the option of having mastectomy the breast is small an area of microcalcification stretches more than 4 cm more than 4 cm so let us just measure this is the scale they have given on mammogram and this is 1 cm okay so this is 1 2 3 4 it's from here to here it's about 5 or 6 cm so this lady uh, requires a mastectomy because the micro uh, mammographic extent of microcalcification is more than 4 cm please remember that in dcis which is not palpable we measure the mammographic extent of the tumor if it's more than 4 cm we should offer mastectomy okay so this was one picture of a mammogram and the picture so this lady came with a lump and you can see some architecture distortion from the rest of the breast can you see this i'll reduce it so the whole breast is like this this the nipple milk ducts subcutaneous fat pre memory fascia breast tissue proper here the pectoralis major retro memory fat this is called the forbidden area of tabar tabar is a famous uh, gentleman uh, radio uh, graphy professor in sweden who have popular, who has popularized the mammography screening and he conducted the initial two county trials in sweden and popularized the mammography screening so he calls it this area as forbidden area because uh, most of the time doctors will check this area and they will miss seeing this area so if you see some abnormality you should look for it so here you have a architecture distortion a well defined lesion is seen here and within that let, let us just magnify oh, okay so i'm trying to magnify can you now see it's beginning to see the microcalcification can you see a cluster here hello yes sir yes okay so within this within this lesion well defined lesion on mammogram we see again they are different shape and sizes okay so again a cluster it's not one it's a cluster of pleomorphic microcalcification cluster of pleomorphic microcalcification okay again feature of highly suspicious berards 4 or so this is another lesion and let us see one more this lady came and reduce it first okay can you see the whole breast whole mammogram so this is okay so she also had blood discharge and she had a big uh, lesion on mammogram so and her calcification was present diffusely by the way this is not this is macro calcification macro this is not micro and this is well defined rounded so it's benign calcification okay rounded calcification may be or longitudinal macro calcification may be in a vessel or benign old calcified fibroid doma or some other lesion you know sclerosing at vessel but if you see cluster of pleomorphic like this area here maybe this here area here so this is a vascular calcification can you see a vessel here can you make out hello yes yes sir can you see a tortuous vessel yes. so within that vessel there is calcification that is because she is 60 year old she is allowed to have atherosclerosis and else atherosclerotic plaques become calcified you know so that's vascular calcification don't confuse it with the 
microcalcification of cancer. This is, these are the areas. Can you see this area? This area here, maybe some area here, but there are macro classification like this. So don't, this is again macro calcification. So we are not talking of that, but uh, we are talking of diffuse micro calcification. So if you, they are present diffusely in the whole breast, then that is a sure indication of mastectomy, either simple mastectomy or skin and nipple areola preserving mastectomy. Why? Because by definition, DCIS is that tumor where there is no infiltration of the skin. If there is infiltration of the skin, we will call it invasive ductal carcinoma. We will not call it DCIS. Similarly, if there is invasion of the nipple, we will call it invasive carcinoma. So DCIS is that carcinoma where there is no infiltration of the skin and no infiltration of the nipple. If this is the case, then why remove the poor skin and poor nipple areola? We can preserve nipple and areola and just remove this tumor bearing breast tissue and perform the skin and nipple areola preserving S. Okay. Good. Good. Full screen. Can you still see the screen? Yes. Sir. Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, what investigations are uh, advocated in a patient suspected to have uh, DCIS? Well, it's like any other lump or any other lady with nipple discharge. Because before biopsy, you don't know whether you are dealing with invasive or in situ. So, you will see a lady with if you breast lump, you arrange mammography, ultrasound, and then image guided core biopsy. And for areas of calcification only, no lump and no art architecture distortion, you arrange a stereotactic biopsy and place a clip. And um, if report is cancer, then make sure that all the microcalcification is removed in the wire guided specimen. The specimen is then uh, uh, put in mammography machine again called specimen mammography to make sure that all the microcalcifications are removed. And somebody should count. If there were 10 microcalcifications in the pre-op mammogram, the specimen should also have all 10. There are nine, you have to go back and remove the one. Okay, so if there is only small architecture distortion, then uh, the radiologist prefer a vacuum assisted uh, biopsy uh, and then put a clip. Okay, and in the histology report, please write that we are, uh, please report ER, PR, and HER. Usually, pathologists uh, do not report on the ERPR status or HER status if it is DCIS. But you'll have to request, okay, this is DCIS and we want to decide about further treatment and the report of this. So what is the treatment guideline? When to conserve the breast and when to do mastectomy? Well, um, if the tumor is uh, small, just a lump, you do wide local excision just as you do for basal breast carcinoma, lumpectomy and lumpectomy should have negative histology margin. So the definition of the negative margin is very important and it has been changing over time. So for a long time, we read that in DCIS, negative margin should be more than 2 millimeter, more than 2 millimeter. In invasive cancer, definition of negative margin is no tumor on the inked margin. What does that mean? When you send the specimen to the grossing room of pathology department, they put a India ink or they paint the surface with some ink, mostly it's India ink, which remains uh, you know, on the specimen even after putting in the form lead and processing so, and washing the specimen. So, then they will cut the section and check whether the tumor cells are reaching the surface of the ink, ink margin. If they are reaching, then margin is positive. If there is no tumor on the ink margin, that means tumor excision is complete. So, in invasive cancer, no tumor in the ink margin is the definition of negative margin. DCIS, this 2 millimeter at least. There has been a recent uh, uh, change in the um, guideline by some uh, authorities. Now they are saying 5 millimeter should be negative in DCIS to reduce the chance of, of a, um, recurrence. 
Now, can somebody think ECIS is a low grade, well behaved type of fever? You know, invasive cancer is more aggressive. Invasive cancer kills the people. DCIS doesn't kill, it doesn't spread. So why they are insisting on wider margin in DCIS and lesser margin in invasive cancer? Invasive cancer, they say, if there are no cell reaching the ink surface, they are happy. Why? In invasive, they should be more aggressive. It's the other way around. Can somebody think of a plausible explanation? Please. So extension through ducts. Very good. So it is what is it called? You'll have to tell the name, pathological name. Cancerization of the duct. Cancerization. Uh -huh. yes. And if it goes into lobule, what is it called? Cancerization of the lobule. Okay, so that is one. But see, DCIS is slow growing. Slow growing lesions or tumors do not, like say lipoma. Do you ever give chemotherapy to lipoma? No, or, no, you know, they, it is a slow growing lesion. Slow growing lesion do not respond to chemotherapy. They will also not respond to any other targeted therapy. So, uh, it has been observed that if you have a DCIS, it will not respond to chemotherapy. The only effective treatment is surgery and radiotherapy. Tamoxifen prevents some recurrence, that's fine. But uh, effective treatments are surgery and radiotherapy. So if you, if you have narrow margin, that means some cells are left. If some cells are left, they will grow and cause more recurrence. And you have no chemotherapy in your hand to use. So then the recurrence will be more. Whereas an invasive cancer, which is rapidly dividing pool of cells, and rapidly dividing pool of cells, respond more uh, effectively to chemotherapy. So we have many chemotherapeutic drugs. In all invasive cancers, more than one centimeter in size, we always give chemotherapy, either neoadjuvant or adjuvant. Okay. So any microscopic cell will be killed by chemotherapy. Here, we have no chemotherapy to work on DCIS because it's slow growing. So therefore, in such slow growing lesions, you have to take a wider margin so that no cells are left because if their cells are left, there will be more recurrences. Okay. So the data is showing that long-term follow-up studies have shown that recurrence is more if you have left tumor with less than two millimeter margin. And now some data is coming that two to five millimeter group will have more recurrence compared to five millimeter. And even you know you saw that. One news classification. In one news in original classification, Dr. Silverstein used 10 millimeter. See, more than 10 millimeter margin. He called it one. Gave the well grade of one. More than 10 millimeter. With a 10, 10 millimeter means one centimeter. So he is expecting you to remove the tumor with 10 millimeter margin. Okay, because he he had observed in his uh, clinic on news screening that recurrence was least when microscopic margin was 10 mm. So this, this, this teaches you that the extent of microscopic margin is of importance in assessing the prognosis that as shown by Dr. Von News prognostic index. Okay. So some examples of microcalcification, then we come to biopsy and small areas, stereotactic or vacuum assisted biopsy. And then treatment is decided based on the size and other features. If it is a small tumor, you can perform wide local excision and, and then offer radiotherapy. If it is ERPR positive, then you can add tamoxifen 20 milligram daily for five. And uh, you can read details of two trials that are of particular importance in uh, uh, the decision making process for ductal carcinoma in situ ECIS. The first trial was called NSAP P17. P17 
and this ascertained the role of radiotherapy. So in this trial, they took the patients with DCIS, performed lumpectomy alone in one group, and the other group they of lumpectomy followed by radiotherapy. Lumpectomy followed by radiotherapy after wide local excision, and they found that if you do wide local excision alone, recurrence is thirty percent. Uh, so can somebody uh, recall the recurrence in lumpectomy alone in invasive cancer? Lumpectomy alone in invasive cancer, how much is the recurrence? If you do only lumpectomy, without radiation, thirty-nine percent. Without radiation, which trial? Which trial showed that? NHCVP zero six. B zero six trial was performed by Dr. Bernard Fisher, and uh, they, they had three arms. This was B zero six recruited up to four centimeter lesion, you know, operable breast cancer. So they had lumpectomy alone. Other group lumpectomy followed by radiotherapy, and third group had MRM, modified radical mastectomy. Okay, so they found lumpectomy had recurrence rate of thirty nine percent. You can remember forty. Other group lumpectomy followed by radiotherapy. How much was the recurrence in twenty years? Fourteen percent. One four, forty fourteen. ऐसे याद कर लीजिए ना. वो forty and fourteen, roughly. Okay. So forty fourteen percent. So forty became fourteen with addition of radiotherapy for invasive breast cancer. For invasive breast cancer. Here thirty became fifteen. Here wide local excision alone in DCIS has a recurrence of thirty. Thirty becomes fifteen. Exactly half by addition of radiotherapy on lumpectomy. Okay. Um, and then they conducted another trial called B24, where after wide local excision and lumpect and radiotherapy, they gave tamoxifen to one group and placebo to other. Tamoxifen to one group and placebo to other, and they showed tamoxifen induced further regression uh, in reduction in the recurrence in the same breast, occurrence of the new tumor in the opposite breast, and Distant metastasis also, all three. Now, why am I talking of distant metastasis in DCIS? Because there could be mix, mix, uh, missed fo uh, foci of invasive carcinoma, which may be metastasis. Very good, very good. Yeah, is DCIS it... doesn't spread. DCIS doesn't spread. By definition, it is that tumor where vessel membrane is intact. It has no business to go to lymphatics or blood vessels or elsewhere in the body. But we never check every cell. Each and every cell of the tumor is never checked. Suppose there are one million cells, a pathologist will check hundred cells or five hundred cells. But nobody ever checks each and every cell of the tumor. There is only one center in the world where the entire tumor and all the lymph nodes are fully processed, processed, and that is called Milan Institute of Oncology. Or in Europe, opened by Dr. Humberto Veronesi and Dr. Gianni Bonadona, and all famous people work there. So they have lot of you know stuff. So they can afford to full full processing of the entire tumor and entire um, breast and even all the lymph nodes, two millimeter cell. But rest of the world, you know, we do just in mastectomy. You do bread loafing. You know, bread loafing like you take us. Whole loaf of bread from the market, from the bakery, and then cut slices of say one centimeter thick slices, and then you put lot of butter and eat it. And so you don't know you what is happening in the within the slice of that bread because they are cut at one centimeter distance. Similarly, you so you can miss a small focus of invasive cancer. You will say it is DCIS. Fifteen years later, patient dies of. So, tamoxifen has been found to reduce occurrence in the recurrence in the same breast, opposite breast, as well as in distant sites. Okay. Now, a word about sentinel node biopsy. Again, why should I be talking of sentinel node biopsy if it is in situ cancer? Because this doesn't spread into the nodes. Same reason. Within a mass of breast cancer, with its with the carcinoma in situ. There may be a focus of either frank invasion or micro invasion. Micro invasion or frank invasion 
may be present in 20 to 30 percent cases if it is high grade uh, if it is more than 4 centimeter in size or it has comedonecrosis okay so these three parameters have been found to be associated with increased 20 to 30 percent chance of hiding a small focus of microinvasion which if left untreated may become metastatic and may kill the baby okay so therefore we should perform sentinel load biopsy if we are doing mastectomy so this few years ago this was the rule we were following that lump is 4 cm or more or there is high grade on histology or comedo necrosis or as dr jatoi te keeps teaching us palpable dcis he says if the dcis is palpable is a lump then you should perform sentinel load because in a palpable dcis a microscopic focus of invasion may be present in a 20% now the current rule is that do sentinel load only if you are doing mastic there's a paper here uh, quoted here you can read more about it but now current guideline says that do sentinel load biopsy only if you are doing mastic and uh, uh, i may uh, i i may request uh, my very senior colleague uh, from uh, sanjay gandhi memorial postgraduate institute in lucknow dr gaurav agrawal is a world famous uh, uh, breast surgeon what is his uh, opinion about sentinel load he is also a world expert in sentinel load biopsy he has de described a new technique using antimony as a marker for uh, as a tracer for sentinel load so uh, dr gaurav what is your guideline for doing sentinel load in dcis Dr. Gaurav, can you listen to me? Dr. Agrawal, Professor Gaurav Agrawal. Thank you, sir. Are you with us? Uh, yes, I am indeed here. Um, yes, please. So, when do you perform the uh, um, sentinel load in a DCIS? Almost entirely as per what, what you have said just now. Uh, Thank but you. One addition I can, an addition I might make to that list is, Wherever we have any feature which may be suggestive of invasive cancer, right? Trying to find microinvasive disease right. in a patient uh, with predominant DCIS disease uh, is a predominant So, what is often is more after you've done a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. Mm -hmm. So, that's a operation. If we have a large palpable or any other features are suspicious of an invasion, invasion, then rather than waiting for the histology, I do have that. But I must also uh, say in the same vein that we do very few DCI, pure DCIS. We operate very few pure DCIS. That's because right. As you so in a year, we get about 10. 10 to 12 DCIS in a year, maybe average one per month, you know, that's the average with us. So, because it's a referral hospital, so we tend to get more. But it's about 10 to 12, there's not more. It is mostly a problem of America and Europe, hours. where they do mammographic screening. And they say that 70 to 80 percent lesions, cancers in America are mammographic or screen detected. So, those DCIS are you know commonly seen and they, most of the time they are impalpable they just present as microcalcification seen on a screening mammogram in a otherwise asymptomatic lady something we don't see that commonly okay so uh, so that is the current guideline they are saying that if you are performing mastectomy for dcis in large um, micro extensive microcalcification or large mass more than four centimeter then you might as well do sentinel load biopsy at the same time why because you will be cutting most of the lip. when you raise a skin flap for mastectomy you go up to the uh, axillary tail you enter the axilla and you will be cutting most of the lymphatics going to the sentinel nodes to axillary nodes and therefore later on if there is a focus of invasion found by a pathologist in the mastectomy specimen your oncologist will ask what is the nodal status 
then uh, instead of cutting a sorry figure to the oncologist, it's better to give the answer. Sir, I have also done sentinel node biopsy and this is the report. 99% time it will be negative, but just in case there is a focus on invasion, it's a good idea, it's a prudent idea to perform sentinel. So, um, so more than 4 cm, we have mastectomy is planned, so we are performing dual tracer technique, you know, you can see blue light and blue dye and is uh, isotope guided with a gamma probe or you can use fluorescein. So in this case, we were doing it with a gamma probe. And um, just to tell about that B, B24 trial, B24 trial, in B24, they added tamoxifen after lumpectomy and radiotherapy. So they found that uh, uh, this is a five-year follow-up, 83% in the placebo were event-free compared to 87 in the tamoxifen. And the total events, invasive plus non-invasive recurrences, occurred in 130 women with placebo and 84 women in the tamoxifen group. And cumulative incidence of all invasive cancer in the tamoxifen group was 4% at 5 years. 2 in the same breast and almost 2, 1.8 in the opposite breast also. The tamoxifen is reducing not only the recurrence in the same breast, but also in the opposite breast. That's the beauty of tamoxifen. Mind you, this will work only in ER receptor positive DCIs. So, you have to do ER status and if it's ER is positive, you can offer 5 years of tamoxifen. 5 years of tamoxifen has been found to reduce recurrence in the same breast, opposite breast and also. Um, incidentally, the survival was 97% at the end of 5 years in both the groups. Whether you So, survival was not altered by tamoxifen, but uh, because there were very few deaths, you know, in DCIS. 97% 5 year survival is reported in DCIS, whether you give tamoxifen or not because main recurrence would be in the breast, ipsilateral or quadrilateral. So, uh, the question, how much to remove? Well, uh, tumor is less than 4 cm, most authors recommend lumpectomy. Tumor is more than 4 cm, especially if the breast tumor to ratio is less. So, a small breast, even 3.5 may be an indication, relative indication for mastectomy. So, assess the tumor to breast ratio, but in general, an average size breast, um, you know, um, it's recommended that lumpectomy for less than 4 cm and mastectomy for more than 4 cm. If you see diffuse microclassification on mammogram, that is surely an indication for removing the entire memory gland, that is full mastectomy, either simple mastectomy or skin sparing mastectomy, and sentinel load biopsy whenever you perform mastectomy. So, Patient desire is of utmost importance. A lot of patient will say, even for a small lesion, Dr. Saab, Pura Nikal DJ, Mary Auntie, Thoda Nikala Tha, or Death Ho Gaiti. So, is, you, know, you know, they will put uh, examples like that. So, we must uh, respect patient's desire. It's her body, her disease. So, patient desire is of utmost importance. Besides this, if you have a multicentric disease, multicentric means two foci. Or more than two foci located more than four centimeter apart or in opposite or different quadrants. Extensive DCIS where you have uh, for some reason you are not able to reach more than two millimeter margin. So you have done a lumpectomy and margin is less and you maybe repeat a sh cavity shave till again you are getting uh, you know, positive or close margin. This indication for mistake and poor tumor to breast ratio, okay? And this is about the epsilateral index breast. What about the opposite breast? Some ladies will say, and the data is also showing that there is increased risk of about 1% per year of the cancer in the quadrilateral breast. And this can be minimized by performing contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, contra CPM it's called, uh, CPM, contralateral prophylactic. Dr. Ismail Jatoi has done a lot of work from San Antonio, Texas on this uh, issue of contralateral prophylactic mastectomy and he has found there is a surge, there is a marked increase in number of women undergoing contralateral prophylactic mastectomy in the recent past and because of some fear, 
the mind of both public, lay public, as well as their treating surgeons, that uh, since there is increased risk of the opposite effects, especially in genetic mutation carrier women, or they have a strong family history. So, depending on those situation, we can offer contralateral prophylactic such as a high risk family history or genetic mutation carrier. So here we did simple mastectomy and once you have done full mastectomy, there is no need for radiotherapy. Okay. So uh, in uh, invasive breast cancer, we do talk of mastectomy followed by radiotherapy, post mastectomy radiation it is called. Here there is no role of radiotherapy once entire breast has been removed. Right. So radiotherapy only after lumpectomy. And uh, now there is some uh, data to suggest that in low grade DCIS, small lesions or screen detected lesions, we can even avoid radiotherapy. Just give tamoxifen for five years, lumpectomy and tamoxifen. Radiotherapy may be avoided if lesion is screen detected, mammographically detected, no lump or a very small lesion. Or there is a genetic risk evaluator in scale. It is called Oncotype DX. Uh, for DCIS. So there is a genetic uh, risk uh, cat, uh, evaluating uh, stratification uh, score available for DCIS. So that will tell whether there is a risk of recurrence. If risk of recurrence is high, you can offer post op radiotherapy otherwise. Okay. But after full mastectomy, no role of radiotherapy. Just a mock when if it's ER positive. Now, if the lady is uh, like this one, she came and she was 54 and her uh, mother had breast cancer, sister had breast cancer. So um, she used to get mammogram yearly as part of the screening. And one year when she reached 54, uh, the radiologist noticed a small lesion, very small lesion. So our radiologist then arranged a clip insertion. And you can see this is the small area. It is partly overlapped by these uh, grids uh, that the radiologist put uh, over the breast uh, in order to do stereotactic biopsy or put a needle or wire insertion. Okay, so stereotactic biopsy in this lady reported in site to cancer, it was low grade and no comedo necrosis. So, what we did, we took this lady to the uh, mammography machine, and you can see this. This was the shadow of the grid. You can see this. Okay. There's a special plate with the scales on the X and Y axis. And by seeing this scale, uh, they will then see on the mammogram whether it corresponds to the same area. See, this is the same scale. So it's like a grid, okay, where there is a scale on this axis and this axis. So they measure, okay, this is this is a nipple. So it's five centimeter posterior to nipple, and it is three centimeter lateral to nipple. So this is how they will calculate the x and y axis ordinates of the lesion and so so with those measurements they placed a, a needle and then within the needle just as you have venflon you know cannula so inside the venflon uh, inside the venflon plastic cannula pvc cannula you have a steel a stilet isn't it so there's a stilet like thing and a wire is then passed. The wire is then passed through that needle. And in this lady, because they did a, a bracketing. Bracketing means if the calcification is extending to some wider area, you don't want to miss any area. So they put one wire here and one wire here. So two wire support. And so in other words, just as you put something in bracket, you know, write um, a digit, say five, and then put in bracket. Or you put, uh, uh, say, uh, you put red blood cells and within bracket RBC, something like that. So you put the area of interest within the bracket of two wires. Okay. And then you excise the entire lesion, keeping in mind that we have to remove that all the tissue located or bracketed between the two wires. It's called bracketing of micro by two wires. You can put more, you know. If it is extending here also, you can put maybe the third wire. So, wire is very small, so you can't see much. You can see the wire here. You can see the wire here. So, then we remove this 
and you have to mark the specimen with the um, loop anterior, long lateral, short superior, and then take this to the mammographic room first to see that both wire tips are included in the specimen. All the micro calcification by count are present, and there is appropriate margin of the tissue. Three things you should check. Then only you should send the specimen to pathology department. Okay, otherwise there may be problem of having missed some calcification and later on in subsequent mammogram next year um, they will find those lesions and then you'll have to do resurgery. So this is the final picture and because it was very small they just gave, decided to therapist decided not to give any radio th uh, therapy just tamoxifen for five years because it was low grade and very small microscopic detection. So a few words about tamoxifen. It's offered only for ER positive tumors, 20 milligram standard dose for five years. Uh, recently, uh, there's a trial uh, called NSAPP35 where aromatase inhibitor has been tried, but uh, we're still uh, waiting for the results. Um, and similarly, some of the um, DCIS are positive for HER2 receptor. Rastuzumab has been used along with radiotherapy. But very interestingly, here trastuzumab is not given for 17 injections, just one or two doses. And they say that the mechanism of action of trastuzumab in HER rich DCIS is immunotherapy. Somehow it potentiates the immune response and will kill the HER rich cells. And so this, uh, this was evaluated in NSAPVB 43 trial and results are still awaited but uh, this has been matter of some uh, study okay so there is no guideline currently to offer trastuzumab other than the scope of a trial so prognosis of dcis is excellent mastectomy cures dcis 20 year survival um, has been reported 98 percent two two percent two out of 100 are dying because of DCIS doesn't kill them, DCIS doesn't spread, missed invasive cancer, okay, a small focus of cancer has been missed and that is the responsible for uh, death due to DCIS. So DCIS doesn't kill, missed invasive cancer, so 20 year survival, 98%, so mastectomy is the cure, you don't need to give uh, radiotherapy after full mastectomy, tamoxifen can be offered to reduce the occurrence of new tumor in the opposite breast okay tamoxifen only for opposite breast hello somebody dr gaurav you are saying something dr gaurav just unmute your mic and then huh? yes please what's your opinion about uh, the long term treatment and adjuvant treatment for dcis after surgery for the low grade and then the issue is relating high grade and with micro invasion and that's right micro invasion uh, for that group only we have to be pretty bothered and with, uh, if it is low grade perhaps uh, we need not bother about uh, right so, so micro invasion in a dcis is a uh, is a issue is a is a matter of concern and uh, a definition is that uh, there is no frank invasion. There is some just breach in the basin membrane, and uh, uh, frank invasion is not seen under the pathologist. Few years later, a uh, few years earlier, we had a lady who, in whom we performed a skin sparing mastectomy, and she presented with nipple discharge and mammography had diffuse calcification, uh, micro calcification. So, in the mastectomy specimen, uh, there were for psi of micro invasion and they were HER rich, HER 3 plus. So uh, there was discussion by oncologists whether to give uh, um, chemotherapy and rastuzumab for her. So uh, we had gone to San Antonio breast meeting. So Dr. Sinu and myself discussed this case. Uh, you know, every day in the San Antonio breast meet symposium, there's a case presentation. So anybody uh, can present their cases and then get the answer from world authorities. We presented this patient as a 
my problem of microinvasion so we were told that uh, there is no data to suggest that chemotherapy or trastuzumab as systemic therapy systemic therapy in any form is of any benefit there is no evidence for that so we told this lady and she lived well for two years then one day she had difficulty in breathing on uh, climbing the staircase uh, ct scan was done which showed diffuse metastasis pulmonary metastasis biopsy of that lung lesion demonstrated breast cancer metastasis her rich then she was put on trastuzumab but she died and within a year she died so sometimes i feel that micro calcification uh, sorry micro uh, invasion micro invasion to me is where pathologist has failed to demonstrate frank invasion they have failed to demonstrate frank invasion and they, therefore they call it micro invasion i just uh, uh, treated now with the chemotherapy having learned from this uh, patients you know uh, so, so i feel that micro invasion means there is they have not looked extensively carefully to rule out any frank invasion so we now treat with systemic therapy whether it's the cis or some other tumor uh, you know so micro invasion should be seen as a suspect area there may be some focus of invasion which our pathologists have missed uh, now if you have done breast conservation followed by radiotherapy tamoxifen will offer 97% five year survival and recurrence after bct occurs in about 15% cases half of them are of invasive cancer and other half are non invasive half invasive half non invasive uh, cancer recurrences after lumpectomy radiotherapy and tamoxifen it will reduce further and um after wide local excision alone recurrence will be the tune of 30% half of them are invasive and half cis so this trial the nscbb b17 trial where they had performed lumpectomy in one arm and then just allowed the lady to live without any further treatment 30% 30 will see the read the right last line so lumpectomy alone wide local excision alone and the lady was left alone 30% 30 out of 100 developed cancer half were invasive type and half were non in dcis so this is perhaps um, a good evidence that if dcis is left alone in the body some of them at least half of them will progress to frank invasive cancer so people sometimes question you know whether invasive cancer occurs de novo or dcis the precursor of you know why we should treat dcis mammographic screening is well established in europe and america um, because they detect dcis and somebody may question why you should you treat dcis dcis will not kill you 98% survival is in 20 year survival 98% why are you treating because we are treating that because about uh, you know some dcis will progress to become invasive so in other words dcis is thought to be a precursor of invasive cancer at least in some people okay, so this gives a strong evidence that if dcis is left in the body some will progress to invasive cancer and therefore it's uh, reasonable it's prudent to treat dcis by some method so it's the ridiculous So I'll stop here and uh, take questions. And because we have very eminent uh, and experienced breast surgeon, Dr. Gaurav Agrawal, so I would value his comments on treatment management of DCI. Dr. Gaurav, please. Thanks for joining. Yes. Thanks. As one of the participants, so perhaps. Oh no, you are a you are a teacher. You are a teacher. <laughs> Your invited guest faculty. Thank you, sir. I, I was uh, trying to point out that Professor Gurpreet Singh is also uh, has also connected. So perhaps. Oh, thank you, thank you. So we can request him also to chip in. So any any personal comment or it's be uh, you know point that you would like to add besides the stereotactic biopsy and then wire guided excision for impalpable lesion. 
and then if it is HER, raised tamoxifen, any other thing that you do differently. And for large tumors, we are now doing mostly skin asparagus. Yeah, this is definitely something. Uh, I mean, I feel we are blessed that we are not uh, compelled to take care of large number of DCIS, unlike surgeons in the Western countries, uh, countries where they have routine population-based tomographic screening, where almost every other day majority of cases in breast surgeons list are actually DCIS and you are invisible cancer. Uh, and then you That's right. Sometimes really wonder why you are treating such patients where you are not even sure if they, they have any uh, risk to or threat to the life or risk to recurrence even. So, uh, of course, choosing out or selecting out those few that have significant risk to life because of a microcalcification or a DCIS, that is a that is the greatest challenge. Van News Index, as you very rightly said, came up as a lot of promise, but unfortunately, others did not. Uh, not many other centers could uh, replicate that kind of uh, information. Worth of that Van News Index, but uh, in hands of Mel Silverstein. Uh, he he swear, still serves by it, and he uses this classification or scoring system to decide which patients require aggressive treatment and which do not. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gaur. Thank you, thanks for joining. And Dr. Gurpreet Singh, we would value your wisdom in the management of DCIS. Dr. Gurpreet Singh, what is the Chandigarh PGI experience? We heard the Lucknow PGI experience, so we would value. Uh, Chandigarh PGI experience. Are you able to hear, Dr. Gurpreet? No. So there's some problem. By the way, what is the corona situation in Lucknow? We heard that uh, your hospital, Sanjay Gandhi, is converted as a COVID hospital. Is it still the case? Yes, one of our uh, buildings, the trauma center, has been. Okay. Convert to the level COVID. three uh, COVID hospital. So we have hundred beds year mark for COVID patients. So which eighty have uh, ventilators or, or ICU beds. Oh. The, I think at this moment we have some thirty odd patients in the isolation in the ICU. Okay. We're positive. We're not positive. But we are fearing that this number will jump any day. Mm. As, as I see, there is a lot of migration has started again. Yeah. The lockdown is not as strict. It's a unique situation of this pandemic. You know, it has stopped at least surgeons working. You know, our elective surgery, our clinics, everything has been put to a halt. Just hope that this pandemic clears very soon and we go back to normal. That is the issue that concerns me most. Uh, we have almost completely stopped all elective surgeries, few aggressive or, or post mutagenic chemotherapy breast cancers or some aggressive diet cancers. Those are the only ones we are operating. So I mean most of the wrong most of the departments are doing the same. But this cannot continue for very long. This is okay to we, we can take a pause for some time, but we cannot keep just be in suspended animation for a very long time. In another week or two, we have to start treating other patients. We cannot make the other other kind of illnesses. Uh, uh, we cannot make those patients suffer. That's right. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your valuable comments. Any other question or comments from any of the audience? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Huh. Um, a very welcome to Dr. Gora, sir. We are very happy to have you here. Uh, sir, could you please tell us something more about uh, use of antimony for sentinel lymph node? Okay, so uh, actually antimony, use of antimony sulfur colloid is uh, not so new. Uh, it has been in use for almost two decades now. As I'm sure most 
audience know that number of radio pharmaceuticals have been used for uh, radio radio guided central lymphoma biopsies. Sulfur colloid has been the predominant or the most common one. But there is a substantial geographic difference. So in Europe, uh, in, in North America, for sure, sulfur colloid was the most commonly used. There are certain countries uh, where cold colloid was very, uh, very commonly used at some time. But in Australia and certain other countries, antimony colloid was popular. Uh, what the reason why we started using antimony colloid was that my colleague uh, Professor uh, Sanjay Gandhi and then me we thought that that's a reasonably uh, inexpensive and effective uh, accurate kind of uh, uh, option and sulfur colloid we would have to obtain from bark or other sources and it would cost something to us whereas antimony colloid we started making in our own uh, radio pharmacy and the cost of antimony colloid that we have been using uh, is less than 100 rupees in for, for every patient. So it is indeed a very, very cheap <laughs> That is the reason we did it. So besides doing the initial uh, um, pilot studies, we also conducted a randomized control trial comparing commercially available sulfur colloid with antimony colloid found in terms of both sentinel identification rates and false negative rates there was no difference uh, when we used uh, with the respective whether antimony colloid was used or sentinel colloid was used the cost of antimony colloid that we uh, found was about uh, if i'm not wrong maybe seven percent of that of sulfur colloid. So it is substantially cheaper option without compromising on the accuracy of central lymph node biopsy. But of course, antimony colloid is something that we have to produce or prepare ourselves, whereas sulfur colloid is available off the shelf from various sources. Thank you, thank you. Very interesting, innovative research. Thank you. In our society, we need to perform um, cost curtailment research, you know, and uh, to make the treatment affordable to the masses rather than just uh, confine it to the top 5% of the elite. So, thank you, thank you. Any other points or comments? Oh, so, uh, yes, uh, DCIS is not very common, but uh, uh, in uh, once a month, you know, you will see some patient who has bloody nipple discharge or serous and hemos serosanguinous nipple discharge. And you may or may not have a lump. And if you have a lump, then biopsy or biopsy if, uh, that will reveal the CIS. Otherwise, you'll have to arrange a stereotactic biopsy of the microcalcification. And if it is diffuse, more uh, large, more than four centimeter or diffuse microcalcification then you offer mastectomy. Otherwise, you offer a lumpectomy for a small lesion and sentinel node biopsy can be done if uh, you are doing mastectomy. So this is in short treatment and tamoxifen is offered to ER positive tumors. Okay. Thank you. It's 1930. Yes, any other question? Good evening, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Katamura. Uh, yes, please. Any questions? Sir, uh, if we have a focus of a lobular carcinoma in C2, a solitary mm -hmm. focus in a single breast mm -hmm. versus multicentric foci in bilateral breast in a different case, mm -hmm. and a third case where there are foci of pleomorphic LCIS. Mm -hmm. So, how different would be the management for all three? First one was a small focus of. LCIS. So yeah, in a solitary breast. LCIS is a, not a cancer. It is a precursor or harbinger of cancer. It's a marker that uh, this patient is likely to develop cancer in future. Okay, it's not a precancer. It is not a, uh, DCIS and LCIS are not similar. Okay, DCIS is a different cancer. If left untreated, yes, 
it will grow, right? But LCIs is not called a cancer. Therefore, in the AJCC 8th edition, in the AJCC 8th edition of uh, TNM staging, LCIs has been removed from that uh, cancer group. It is only a high risk lesion. Okay. The, if a lady has a report of lobular carcinoma in situ or lobular lesion, that's a new lobular neoplasia, is a new term. They don't call it carcinoma. And the relative risk for cancer conversion is 10 to 11. Okay, 10 to 11, very high relative risk. Double, you can remember as double the ADH and ALH. ADH, LH, 4 to 5, and LCIS is 10 to 11. Okay, very high risk if uh, of developing cancer in the future. So, you explain uh, this to the lady, and what is most important in imaging? If the report is globular carcinoma, anybody? What imaging must be done? Must be done. Sir, MRI. 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 What is rule of 10? What is rule of 10? Rule of 10 for globular? Sir, it is seen in 10% are bilateral. 10% of all cancers globular. 10% bilateral, 10% multicentric. Rule of 10 teaches us that because of bilaterality and multicentricity, in any lesion on biopsy showing lobular glacier, we must arrange a contrast enhanced mammography of uh, MRI of both breasts in the special breast coil, not in ordinary mammography MRI machine, in breast coils where lady lies prone and her breasts hang into two holes in the table inside the breast coil. So, first MRI must be done, okay? And what more you should ask if it's a lobular lesion? Detailed family history of first and second degree relative having breast, ovarian or other cancers which may suggest some, some family, some genetic, some uh, syndromes. Name some syndrome, Cowden syndrome. What, what all do you get in Cowden syndrome? Cowden thyroid cancer. Breast cancer. Yes. Colonic. Breast and thyroid and colon. renal thyroid and colorectal polyp, polyps mm -hmm. and, and hematomas. Okay. Right. Can can you can you see the can you see the slide? Can you see the blank slide here? Yes, Hello? sir. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So I have made a formula, BERT, for Cowden syndrome. C O W D E N. Cowden syndrome. Okay. I'm not writing syndrome. For Cowden syndrome, BERT. Remember BERT. B is for. What is B for? Bre breast. B for breast. Okay. E for. Endocrine. Endometrium. Endometrium. Endometrium, okay. R for what is R for? Penal. Penal. Penal cell carcinoma. And what is T for? Thyroid cancer. Okay. So remember BERT, B E R T. Breast, endometrium, renal, and thyroid, and also colon. No? So oh, yeah. you can say C BERT or col colorectal. No? You should say colorectal. Or only coral. I think it should colorectal. And what is the gene involved in Cowden? Gene. Name the gene. P10. 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 Okay. Autosomal dominant with variable penetrance. Presence of P10 gene. Okay. Mutation of P10 gene. What is full form of P10? Phosphotensin and Phosphotensin and Phosphotensin. Sin, sin, phosphotensin, phosphotensin on, on, tenth chromosome, tenth chromosome, tenth, is it chromosome, no? Can somebody check? Phosphotensin on, tenth chromosome, okay. So, P10 gene gets mutated and leads to Cowden syndrome and patient classically present birth. 
breast, endometrium, renal, and thyroid, and may also have uh, Okay. So you take all this family history and maybe genetic counseling and genetic testing uh, because lobular carcinoma may be part of family, familiar, okay? if it's, especially if it is bilateral. So treatment will be then detailed counseling, genetic testing, and if MRI shows multicentricity, opposite area involvement, then you can offer several things depending on what is her age and has child children if she has breastfed the child and does not want any more children then you say okay madam we can offer bilateral risk reducing mastectomy risk reducing mastectomy why don't we say prophylactic mastectomy because there is still about 10 percent chance of getting cancer even after skin is wearing mastectomy why because we may leave a small amount of breast tissue under the nipple in the milk ducts or in the periphery of the breast okay so about 10 percent ladies may also have recurrence in the nipple area in the skin and nipple is wearing mastectomy to reduce that 10 percent recurrence you can remove the nipple area just do standard skin is wearing mastectomy removing nipple area that's one option and reconstruct this skin is wearing mastectomy either by putting a silicone gel implant or putting fat or some autologous microtaneous or adipofacial or muscular flap. So, skin is very mastectomy is one option. Prophylactic or risk reducing mastectomy. Other option, she doesn't want to have operation, put her on tamoxifen 20 milligram daily for five years. Uh, so, name some trials where Tamoxifen was shown to be beneficial in high-risk women. Name some trials, NSABP trial or European trial. Sir, NSABP 14 trial, AT ATAC trial, ATOM trial. These were uh, in the adjuvant setting and in the preventive setting, uh, we had uh, NSABP P1 and P2 at the start trial. And then we had the IBIS 1 and 2 trials. Very good. So in America, NSAPP P1, P for Peter, prevention, P for prevention, prevention one trial evaluated the role of five year of tamoxifen versus placebo in high risk women, where according to Gale model, it was estimated that the risk of a lady developing a cancer would be more than 1.7 percent, I think annual, 1.7 percent annual risk. Just check on that, right? So Gale model ladies who were estimated to have higher risk for breast cancer they were put on five years of tamoxifen and there was 50 percent reduction in the risk of breast cancer 50 percent reduction in the risk of developing breast cancer most breast cancers prevented were actually of er positive type er negative cancers uh, were not prevented so it, tamoxifen controls er positive tumors only. so this is in america in, in Europe, IBIS-1 trial was similar, tamoxifen versus placebo in high-risk women. Okay, and IBIS-2 uh, trial compared anastrozole with the, uh, with tamoxifen or, yeah, three arms, no? is it three arms? In IBIS-2, anastrozole versus tamoxifen. Or combination. Or combination, three, three arms. And in, uh, uh, in America, uh, Prevention 2, P2 trial evaluated role of raloxifene comparing to tamoxifen. Raloxifen versus tamoxifen, STAR, okay, STAR trial, STAR. So all these trials have shown the benefit of chemo prevention of breast cancer. Chemo prevention, by chemicals you can prevent breast cancer. About 50% reduction occurs with either anastrozole or tamoxifen or raloxifen and with these in high risk, in the high risk women. Other so 90% risk reduction with the risk reducing mastectomy, 50% reduction with tamoxifen. And some earlier studies showed that bilateral salpingo for it to be, salpingo, removing both ovaries, just like tamoxifen, removing both ovaries, you can reduce 50% risk of breast cancer. But later on, the gentleman who had done this analysis, he himself confessed in a meeting that I had done it wrongly. So 
so i take uh, you know the responsibility um, uh, for this wrong uh, analysis and a lot of women throughout the world were put to, and had were subjected to uh, bilateral salpingophrectomy with the objective of reducing risk of breast cancer but later on he said no that was wrong analysis but uh, you can still remember tamoxifen 50% risk reduction bilateral salpingophrectomy will certainly reduce the chance of ovarian cancer so a lot of these familial cancers are breast and ovarian uh, high risk family you know H hobc high hereditary breast and ovarian cancer so this is about localized uh, lobular carcinoma and if it's bilateral again we'll do mri and we'll evaluate the family history and uh, um, again offer the same thing the treatment will be same uh, remember one thing that if it is only lci as a small focus then even if margin is positive we are not going back like in dcis we will say okay uh, remove the whole lesion with at least 2 mm margin and these days some people are saying 5 mm negative margin. but in lcis we are not requesting you to attain positive mark okay in lcis just get a biopsy if it is lobular get mri and family evaluation and genetic counseling but no need to remove the lesion with negative margin because it is not a cancer okay so is your answer is your three questions answered correctly or not Uh, in that one component was a pleomorphic LCIS will be addressed in similar way to the LCIS which we addressed right now. We are doing bilateral complete removal of the entire ductolobular TDLUs. Okay, so whether it is pleomorphic yes. or non-pleomorphic, the whole thing is gone. Both bilateral mistake. Yes. So and uh, one more question was, sir, uh, when we discussed regarding uh, radiation post mastectomy for invasive uh, ductal carcinoma, mm -hmm. sir, uh, where you had said that, that uh, for even one node positive we would offer radiation, sir. In that, when we talk about radiation, is it uh, radiating only the bed of the tumor or is it with the axilla? Yeah, radiation of the axilla. You ask a radiotherapist. We are surgeons. Okay. And in the exam, in the exam, you will be asked whether you will send this patient for radiotherapy or not. Okay, what will be the fields? How many doses? Tangential field, this field, that field is not. You, you are not uh, going to have MD radiotherapy exam. So you should just focus in your area. You say that uh, the uh, Oxford overview meta-analysis has shown that uh, if we, even one node is positive, then Radiotherapy after mastectomy reduces the death rate and reduces the chance of local regional recurrence. Therefore, uh, we will offer radiotherapy. What is okay. the exact okay. field of radiotherapy? You no, know, this to be decided by uh, MD radiotherapy person. You know? right. Yes. Sir. Never in your life uh, you should also just remember that during surgery I should know how much is radiation field, clavicle to inframembrary crease. Midline to mid axillary line, at the most posterior axillary line. So all scars. Your duty as a surgeon is to know the radiation field. All these scars must be within this field, so that the radiation field is not increased, and you do not unnecessarily irradiate the opposite breast, underlying lung, and heart, especially the anterior descending branch of left coronary artery (LAD). Okay, that is your duty. Yes. You need not know the exact field and how many reds and. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. So uh, I've sent some papers. You can distribute those papers um, on the uh, carcinoma in situ and uh, share with others. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, next topic. So pages to see. Sir. Okay, pages. So three days from now, we'll so study about pages, and you should be ready. You know, people should be ready to ask questions because they know the topic in advance. So, so you know, then learning is more intensive. You already read the subject once, 
then you can uh, enter into this active discussion rather than just passively absorbing the information like a, they say you should not learn like a uh, like a sponge you know you know the bathroom is sponge so you soak it in water it is full you squeeze it and the entire water comes out and the sponge remains dry so a sponge has not retained anything so you should not learn like a sponge you should assimilate or internalize the information internalize the knowledge into your sulkai and gairai in your own brain and the way of doing that active learning is you read it subject beforehand and then enter into active discussion so that you internalize the idea otherwise you tend to forget it. especially for rare condition like cowden syndrome in your life you will probably see one or two cases I have not seen any cow, and I have seen only one P53 Lieberman syndrome. We do see BRCA mutation quite commonly, but if, so keep reading the subject and then come ready with the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.